Can you think of an experience that goes deep enough to be positively life-changing, that might have the potential to make us more human? When the first astronauts came back from space, they were indeed deeply moved, as if something happened out there that they couldn't quite understand, but that shifted their perspective and their worldview. This was later called the overview effect. After his first space flight, astronaut Edgar Mitchell stated, we went to the moon as technicians, we returned as humanitarians. You develop an instant global consciousness, a people orientation, an intense dissatisfaction with the state of the world and a compulsion to do something about it. From out there on the moon, international politics looks so petty. Isn't that the kind of experience we wish more people would have? Especially in the light of current politics, of increasing rhetorics of hate, isolationism, ignorance, or terror. But honestly, most of us will never become astronauts. I mean, is there a way we could use technology, such as virtual reality, to provide more people with a glimpse of such powerful transformative experiences? Imagine we could do this safely from Earth without having to spend all the money, time, effort, and incredible carbon footprint and pollution of shooting more rockets into space. Imagine we could give such experiences to people who would otherwise never be able to do it because they're not young, healthy, fit, or rich enough to do that. so. This is one of the reasons why I and many other researchers around the globe are excited to bring these experiences into our labs using virtual reality. So we can learn how they really work, research them, understand what factors are important, and how we could use technology to design for them so we could ultimately make them accessible to the broad audience. But especially for those who might not have had a chance yet to try virtual reality, what is it really? Let me just give you a very simple example. So here, you can simply explore virtual Vancouver by facing and leaning in the direction you'd like to go. No hands needed. So what's special about virtual reality? Well, you can do and experience things you could otherwise not do, like flying. So in a way, virtual reality is the closest we might have to lucid dreaming or flying dreams. But you're awake and just like Neo in the Matrix, you're empowered to do things, experience things you could not otherwise do. You can take on different perspectives, you can immerse yourself, you can have embodied, visceral, first-person, direct experiences. And it doesn't feel like you're looking at a screen anymore, but you're looking through a window onto the virtual environment. So you can have the embodied sensation of really being there, of presence. So. Could virtual reality make us more human? I believe it has that potential if we really combine it with strong ethics so we know which experiences we should create and which ones should never be created. If you democratize it as a creative medium, if you give more people access to these experiences and the tools and the skills, teach them the skills on how to do that, and then combine this with research so we better understand how these experiences work, what factors are important and how we could use technology and which experiences are actually worth creating. You might still wonder, I mean, why use virtual reality? It's still a little bit of a technical effort. But there's clearly quite a difference between passively watching something on a 2D screen where there's actually being there, experiencing yourself, have an agency. Let me give you an example from the real world. A few years ago, when I was in Indonesia, I wasn't really planning on going scuba diving, but it was just so hot that I really felt like I had to be in the water. So on my second day of still learning to scuba dive, we went to Batu Bulong, an inconspicuously looking rock, and we d dived down to 15 meters. And initially, I was still fiddling with the gear and trying to breathe calmly once I could, and looked up, I was just positively stunned in awe, in wonder by all these amazing creatures around me, not even afraid of me. I really felt like I was immersed, I was in a nature documentary, 
and it could literally hallucinate David Attenborough himself <laughs> narrating my experience. <laughs> no kidding. But something was different. I also felt this visceral connection to this environment, to these creatures, and a deep urge that we have to protect this. And this took me a little bit by surprise because, I mean, literally I have seen so many nature documentaries before, maybe even of prettier, cuter, larger animals, but none of them had affected me that deeply. So th there was clearly a huge difference between seeing something beautiful on a screen and actually having a first-hand direct experience. And I wish I could share this experience with more people. I mean, would we almost automatically start caring and protecting more if we just felt a deep enough visceral connection? Just like when you hold a baby or your cute little puppy in your arms, you look into their eyes too deeply, too longly, and then oxytocin gets released, and you have this kind of bonding experience, and you really just feel compassion and love for it, and out of this comes this almost visceral urge that you want to protect it, you want to take care of it. And this is quite different than just the rational thought of, oh, I should really recycle more or reduce my carbon footprint because it's really good for the environment. It's almost like, well, once you have a deep enough experience, your perception, your thinking, your behavior almost changes automatically. So take a moment. Think about an experience you might have had yourself that positively transformed you, that might have shifted how you think and behave. Are there experiences you wish you could share with others? Or experiences that you wish you or others could experience? But what if these experiences aren't really that easily accessible? For example, if it's a bit difficult to become an astronaut, or if you're just not physically or financially able to afford them? I mean, is there a way we could use virtual experiences? Could these be transformative? I mean, for that to work, they would really need to have real-world effects. I mean, is there any strong, solid evidence that virtual experiences can have real effects? So let's take a look at research. Have you ever wondered what it might be like to be in a different body, to be of the opposite sex, to be of a different race, to be taller, shorter, thinner, larger? Do you think a glimpse of such an experience might somehow affect your thinking and behavior? Well, it sure does. Researchers from universities in London and Barcelona showed that embodying an avatar of a different race or gender can actually reduce your unconscious biases. So for example, if you're white and just for 12 minutes embody a dark-skinned avatar, that was enough to reduce unconscious biases afterwards. And of course, it doesn't completely and forever go away, but it's a step in the right direction. And in our current political climate, isn't that an experience we wish more people could have? Other researchers showed that superhero-like flying can actually enhance pro-social behavior. We also know that virtual exposure therapy can really help to reduce anxiety disorders. Or if you immerse yourself in a virtual snow world, this can help to reduce acute burn pain, actually above and beyond what opioids alone can do. And if you embody, if you become an animal in virtual reality, that can enhance your connection to nature. So how about the overview effect? It turns out it's not quite as simple as just teleporting somebody up into a virtual ISS space station. You need to carefully craft and design the whole experience. So it's a risky long-term research project. But the first results are promising. So we know already that when we ex did our first experiments on virtual flying, most of the participants already experienced awe and wonder. And almost half of them even experienced chills and goosebumps, not because it was cold, like here, but because people were so deeply touched and moved. Now, this is really exciting to me as a researcher because we know that our experiences are positively related to increases in life satisfaction and medical benefits, such as reduced inflammatory markers. And these are known to, do, to be correlated with a lot of chronic diseases, such as cardiovascular diseases, diabetes, or depression. But you might still wonder, I mean, who can actually afford and create these experiences? And what if I wanted to create my own experience? 
And indeed, when it started off in virtual reality, it was a little bit inaccessible. It existed only in a few labs. And just to have a computer fast enough to render a virtual city, that was a lot simpler than the one you've seen here, cost more than a million dollars. Things have changed drastically. Just five years ago, at a conference, a colleague of mine over dinner took out this little cell phone, put it in this self-built slide viewer, and that was the first time we could ever experience virtual reality over dinner without all the gear, without all these extra need for cables and tracking and software and hardware. And I thought, wow, this is amazing. It really is a step towards democratizing the medium. We have to bring this back and put it into the hands of more people and empower them to really use it as an outlet for their creativity, their creative thoughts. So when I came back to Simon Fraser University here in Vancouver, here, where I do research and teach, I started redesigning a course on immersive environments for our undergrad students, and I tasked them to try and create meaningful experiences, to really go beyond what you might traditionally associate with virtual reality. So no ego shooters, no porn, no horror games, no violence. What came out of this was quite impressive. For example, you could become the sea turtle and experience yourself how your home coral reef was destroyed by human-caused pollution, climate change, coal bleaching. Wouldn't you take this more personal? In another semester, we asked people to create empathetic experiences, experiences that might lead to more compassion. In one of these examples, Parallel Minds, I could really get a sense of what it might be like to have a psychotic episode and be tormented with visual hallucinations, hearing voices, because I experienced myself a glimpse of it. So it's really fascinating to see the variety of different ideas and projects that our creative students came up with. But what was probably the most rewarding for me as an instructor and a mentor was really when I could sense the students' empowerment. One of them called it the, oh my god, I'm a wizard phenomenon. <laughs> <laughs> so they experienced that within less than two months, you can use, learn a new tool, a new software, new theories, and bring it together and create new, novel, exciting, maybe even beautiful experiences that you haven't even had yourself, and then even share it with others. But you might wonder about the ethics. Isn't there a dark side to virtual reality? I mean, don't people just become more isolated, removed from reality, addicted and traumatized? And indeed, I am deeply worried about this. We have to do something about this potential. I mean, there's increasing evidence that just playing violent video games is linked to increases in aggressive thinking, feelings and behavior and reduced empathy and pro-social behavior. And those video games are not even immersive, first-person, embodied, or visceral at all. So clearly, virtual reality has a huge potential for good and for bad. But just like many other powerful medium, they are not inherently good or bad, nor are they neutral. What we do know is that they are very quickly becoming increasingly affordable, accessible, and powerful. Powerful to a level where we might be able to provide almost medical-grade immersive experiences. How would we deal with that? I mean, in medicine, we have this amazing, beautiful history of a Hippocratic Oath and the mandate to first do no harm. I posit that we need a similar Hippocratic Oath for virtual reality and really any other of these powerful media. Whether we like it or hate it, what technological evolution brings us, we should not ignore it and we should not leave it just up to the free market. It won't regulate it. So could virtual reality make us more human? I believe and I'm convinced it really can, but we need strong, clear ethics. We need to democratize it as a creative medium, give more people access to these experiences and tools and carefully teach them the skills and how to do something meaningful, positive with it and then combine this with research so we really understand how these experiences work, how to design for it, how the technology works, and really to bring this together, we can design positive transformational experiences that have the potential to make us more human. 
So, if TED is about ideas worth spreading, could the future of virtual reality be about experiences worth spreading? My vision is to empower people to create positive, transformational experiences worth spreading. Thank you. Thank you.